Oh, I did. Oh, uh, oh, sure. It's yeah. I'm hoping Hossein comes soon because I, I need his little laser pointer thing. Uh, wait, where's the share part? Uh, so you have to go to Zoom. Is that here? Oh, sorry. Yeah. And we want the right screen, which is this one here. All right, good. <laughs> I thought I almost had it down. I mean, this the last time. Yeah, I, I completely recorded my own. The entire lecture was just me without the recorder. Yeah.
Still have to wait for Hussein. I guess I can set it up. electric field um, by um, optically uh, looking at how uh, it affects the atoms in a vapor cell uh, or in a dielectric sensor. I talked about vapor cells yesterday and kind of the, the varied engineering of those. Here. And what we're really going to look at is this um, 
in, in this next part of the lecture is the splitting between these two um, EIT transmission peaks as a measure of that uh, field. This is self-calibrated because the only thing that comes in here is the measurement of the splitting, which is a frequency, um, an exact number of H bar, parameter we want to know, and then the structure of um, the atoms. Um, it's clear here, um, if we really go and look at an example here, this is for cesium, that um, given the uh, information I gave you in the first lecture about Doppler shifts, the remainder of Doppler shifts, because um, the wavelengths of these two transitions are not exactly matched, um, that mismatch leads to some residual Doppler broadening, which then gives the breadth of those EIP transmission peaks. And if you work that out, as I <clears throat> told you how in the first lecture, um, the width of these peaks is about three and a half megahertz. It's clear that if we wanted to sense smaller and smaller fields, that the, um, the kind of smallness of that field that we could sense is determined by um, when these peaks start to overlap with each other and when we can actually resolve um, that splitting. So that's kind of the end of the outer towns regime um, where the measurements are really self calibrated. I told you we could sense fields at lower amplitudes than that, but then we have to kind of look at how. Um, you know, we start to destroy the EIT um, interference feature, uh, which we can do as well. But, you know, for this talk, the point is to improve this. Okay. And so we don't have really, you know, unlimited freedom to choose these lasers. This is usually a weak transition, as most of you know, because you work with um, Rydberg atoms. This is our famous D2 transition. Um, and so, um, we can't really easily match these maybe with two photons um, that would, and, and still be able to tune over uh, a variety of Rydberg states, kind of still having uh, access to all these different carrier frequencies uh, to measure. And so um, what we came up with in cesium and found in cesium is a, uh, a method where we could get three photons to almost cancel um, the Doppler shift. So there's some advantages of that in addition to um, narrowing these lines. And so here are those schemes. So um, instead of using the D2 line, we use the D1 line. And then we also go up to a higher line state. It's actually it's a Rydberg state. Uh, it's an 9S state. And then we use a, a infrared photon to go up to um, the Rydberg state. There's some interesting things about the physics of using three photons. But the main motivation was is that we can get almost perfect, well, not perfect, but approximate Doppler cancellation in this configuration where <clears throat> we have counter propagating 895 nanometer and 2.2 micron uh, lasers uh, to the 636 beam. And you can see that using the information I gave you in the first lecture. If you can think about this system in two, um, let's say, straightforward ways that would map back on to the uh, the optical scheme that I told you about at the beginning. And that would be is if you detune from one of these intermediate transitions to then adiabatically eliminate that level, um, then this becomes an effective single photon transition, or this becomes an effective single photon transition. Then you can use the formulas that um, uh, I introduced in that lecture one to um, estimate what the uh, kind of um, spectral width of the, the features is uh, under these conditions. And if you do that, because you get this cancellation um, <clears throat> for the scheme where we're detuned from, uh, sorry, from this guy, then we would say that we could probably get something around 20 kilohertz, which is a improvement of 160. And in this other case, um, I guess in this case here, where this lifetime is longer, um, then we get around 12 kilohertz, which is a factor of 300. And so, of course, if you see that these, these improvement numbers, you're saying for sure that we want to do this because anywhere you can get a factor of 10, you're pretty ecstatic. And if you get a factor of 100, you're um, pretty much in heaven as an experimentalist. So we wanted to do this. Um, the, one of the challenges here is this 2.2 uh, micron laser. That's not an easy uh, laser to use. And so you'll see that that's kind of been made one of our main challenges. Um, it's more of a technical challenge. 
I would like to also point out you could probably, you know, you could do this if you had angle tune beams, right? Um, to change their K vectors. But if you wanted to change the river, say you really have to change the angle, which is a terrible idea for something that you want to actually do in practice. And also, um, you are limited to the interaction region where the beams would actually overlap. So for equal powers of lasers, you um, lose in sample size. And what's nice about this, which is uh, which I want to really point out, is this is collinear scheme. So this is no different, really, than the scheme that we use in the in um, this optical preparation and readout, which is pretty important because now we can propagate down a long cell or a long channel and still have a long interaction region. So if you looked at the, if you actually thought about the photonic crystal device that I uh, told you about yesterday. You could never angle tune in a device like that, right? Because it's got a long channel in it. And, um, you know, you, you couldn't actually get the beams in there, at least easily. And it wouldn't be along the whole channel, probably. Um, okay, so that's the point. Interesting thing about this scheme, uh, which makes it really different than kind of the plain EIT scheme, although I'll call it like an EIT black scheme, is that you start to get different interferences. Um, if you remember back when I told you about how this actually worked, photon, photon, and then a Bravi flip. Now you can imagine that this thing gives you Bravi flip at the top in the simplest kind of um, intuitive way, and that then you would induce absorption. That's usually how we use this. But if you change the laser Bravi frequencies, um, and that's just changing the probe laser here at 895 nanometers, what its power is, you can flip from uh, an absorption feature, which is the easy one that I just told you about, to um, an added transmission feature where, um, in this case, the two upper laser beams on the upper levels are now acting as a single coupling laser. So there's kind of more physics in this um, the scheme, but it's based on the same thing as EIT, uh, interference between these different uh, processes that can happen in the atom. So it's another example of being able to kind of tailor the atom with light fields to do um, some interesting things. Um, so uh, what I'm showing here is how this kind of affects the Doppler shift. So this is the old scheme, the two photon scheme, and this is the three photon scheme. And this is the coupling laser detuning. Here I've, I've called the coupling laser the upper laser. Um, and this is a plot of the velocity distribution here. This is light because this is in um, transmission. And this is dark because it's in absorption. Um, as I said in the last slide. But um, what you should see here is that um, as you would tune across the feature here, you're addressing very narrow um, uh, group of atoms, but you address them um, in kind of different sections as you would tune across that, uh, that uh, EIT resonance. In this case, the difference is, is that you're addressing almost all the atoms when the coupling laser goes to zero and this kind of is scaled so you can't see it all, but you see this line here. So actually the other advantage of using the scheme when you enhance the Doppler shift is that you get more atoms participating in the overall process. So the signal will go up uh, uh, in relation to the signal that you would get here. Or vice versa, you could use less atoms to get the same signal. This is an example of that. So um, what I've done across the top here, um, because this is a little bit harder to show experimentally because we have to change the line width of, the, of one of the lasers, uh, but these are calculations and uh, uh, that show the, the, that effect. So the blue here on the top with these parameters um, and the red here with these parameters is a comparison uh, of, uh, for different kind of RF um, sensing uh, Robby frequencies. Uh, the line shapes. And you can see here that, of course, with this three photon, we get much narrower features and we can resolve much narrower splittings. The bottom here shows a comparison between blue, which is the um, zero temperature or Doppler 3 case, and the case for the three, uh, the three photon approach. And um, what you're supposed to notice here is that um, although it's not exactly the same as the zero um, temperature case or the, or the uh, throws an atom case, it starts to get close to that um, uh, because 
uh, we're capturing a lot more of the atoms. So we don't quite get the same intensity, but we have something that's much more comparable to uh, what you would get if uh, you just set all the atoms to talk to light. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. A lot of big improvement. So um, this is the experiment. It's not very complicated. Um, this is a tabletop experiment. Uh, this takes place in a regular standard glass paper cell. And um, we shoot uh, microwaves at it and then um, you know, put the lasers in the configuration that I told you about. Um, so this is the EIT feature from the 9S state. So of course, this is also an EIT system and you can look at the EIT there. And usually what we do is we lock this to the peak here and then the uh, 2.2 basically would induce a change here that then we would observe as the RF has changed. Um, so uh, we haven't been able to get down to 20 kilohertz, but um, we have been able to get down to 500 kilohertz in a, in a vapor cell. Um, we know why this is the case, and I alluded to it before. It's essentially that this 2.2 micron laser, um, we still have to line narrow it. It's, it's pretty difficult to line a lot. So we, this is a home-built laser. Um, it doesn't have the same quality as the lasers you probably would use, um, you know, in uh, laser cooling and trapping for, uh, you know, the kind of common applications that these layers can develop. So we have to work with a partner to get these gain chips here and then we make our own laser. Um, hopefully soon we'll have this um, line narrow uh, more. Um, but anyways, I think this is still kind of nice, 500 kilohertz in the vapor stock. This is some data. Um, I kind of showed this uh, figure before yesterday to illustrate that, you know, when you're using a standard vapor cell and motivate the kind of design of vapor cell is because of deviation here from reflection of these higher frequencies, just as a reminder. But what's nice here is that now you can uh, resolve the outer town splitting to much, um, to much lower um, uh, kind of uh, field level. So the effective splitting. And so this can be, this is basically improved by something like a factor of seven. Um, it also allows you uh, to better or more easily see and observe uh, the effects of hyperfine structure and optical pumping, which are actually important for, um, you know, uh, measurements that are done at these spectral resolutions. So um, these are both done at nearby frequencies. You can see here that the launch state of the Ritberg is the same 42 p3 halves, but this transition is taken to 41 d5 halves, and this is to the other fine structures that you hear. They're separated by about a gigahertz. Um, and the difference here is the multiplicity of this transition and this transition are different. So um, you have to think about um, you know, optical pumping effects and what transitions you're driving here. You can see here that there's two peaks that split out, and that's because there's um, two transitions that we can drive with the, um, with the uh, uh, RF field. And um, what you're seeing here in the difference between um, how these peaks split really is just the difference in the angular factors in front of the uh, transition dipole. So the basically these are clutch forward coefficients. That's what's shown here. So if we look at the 10.7 uh, transition, and we light a line um, where we have the set power of the RF, and then we have the field strength uh, plotted over here um, uh, under uh, the assumption that we're driving these stretch transitions set up to drive the stretch transitions. Um, they put they line the line, and then if we um, look and at our kind of calculations and we see the transitions that we drive in this case, then there's kind of two sets here because we're uh, the, the two multiplicities of the launch state and the final state are the same. Uh, we get two. And if we um, look at those and, and um, scale them by the dipole moment to determine the field strength, everything kind of lies on the same line. This point's kind of a little bit of an outlier liar because um, this transition dipole moment is weaker. And this is a fit to a, a level where the two peaks aren't really split anymore. That's why it's off. So um, I guess the uh, kind of nice thing about this three photon is that um, we're able to already, even though we don't have ideal lasers, 
um, increase the spectral resolution um, of the measurement by at least a factor of seven or eight, which is pretty good, uh, with the hopes that we can increase it much more. Um, and also, um, it's allowing us to see some of the underlying uh, physics um, that usually gets buried because um, uh, we usually think that uh, the river hyperfine states don't matter. And, and I think it's uh, important to, to look and see uh, if that's really the case uh, in your experiment. Okay, so that's the end of that part. So what I'm going to talk about now is something completely different. Well, not really completely, but almost. Um, what I'm going to talk about is um, uh, sensing uh, pulse uh, pulse RF fields. So that's, of course, important in things like communication and radar. Um, so, so it is going to be a little bit of a, a different um, uh, uh, avenue, let's call it. Um, and I'm going to go back to the old kind of standard um, detection scheme here. Uh, you don't have to have this really high spectral resolution in, in this case. Um, this is kind of a cartoon, uh, you know, pictures of the experiment again. Here again, we have a conventional glass uh, vapor cell with cesium in it. Uh, we're going to shoot, <coughs> excuse me, um, RF at that vapor cell. And, uh, you know, we have the conventional setup where we counter propagate the two beams and detect uh, on this transition. All right, so um, with the RF off, um, we would just observe kind of an EIT signal, right? Uh, nothing special about that, it's just the standard EIT in that two photon uh, setup. Um, if we were to sit and think about pulses coming into a detector like this, we would sit the lasers here and want to look at the changes uh, that are induced by an RF pulse um, as uh, uh, we would look essentially just at the change in the transmission of the probe laser. When the RF comes on, we get a splitting. If the, in this case, the field is, uh, the RF field is rather large. Um, we get a response, and this is the change in transmission as a function of time, and this is the pulse. So there's something important here this is the shape of the pulse that was uh, emitted by the antenna. And this is the pulse that was detected um, uh, using uh, the atoms. So you can see that there's significant shaping of the pulse here by the response of the atom. So that's, an, that's the important thing to take into account. And that's most of what I'm going to talk about. It's how, does, how do the atoms uh, respond to the pulse? Because this will kind of uh, tell us you know, how we have to think about um, sensing these types of pulses. Okay. All right. So this is some more data here. This is also data that's highly average. Um, and what you can see here is that um, if you use very short pulses, say 50, 50 nanoseconds, you could still resolve them, but um, they don't reach uh, the full height here because uh, system can't actually respond that fast. And so it looks here that you don't kind of reach something close to the, the full um, amplitude until uh, you have about a two microsecond pulse, although there's still a response. Um, if you look at it, one raw pulse and then uh, kind of an average pulse, um, we can point to several different features uh, in the pulse that uh, uh, you know, are where the atoms are kind of shaping uh, the response. And we can ask the question, why is that happening? And so uh, there's a couple different things here. One is there's a fast transient. If you're in the right regime, if you're kind of towards the weak probe machine, the BIT. Then there's kind of a slower response here. And then there's kind of a slower response on the tail after a fast kind of uh, decay. So what are those? So to do uh, or to understand that, um, we put together uh, just a density matrix model, that probably most of you would do to try to model this. Um, it's, in a, it's in a vapor cell, so we didn't want to measure, or sorry, model um, collisions in detail. We wanted to make our life simple. Um, so we modeled all the bad things that can happen to the river state with the dark state. There's not very much, the densities aren't uh, of the, excited atoms are not really high enough for us to care about anything bad that could happen at this state. But 
uh, all the bad stuff kind of happens in the reverse state, right? Because they have very large collision cross sections. Um, they're very um, susceptible to stray fields and on all kinds of effects like that. So these things are the most fragile. So um, they're the things that can, um, bad things can happen in a dark state. So what can happen, a collision could knock this into a different river state that's uncoupled from the system. You could get spontaneous emission from the river states that would knock this out of the, um, out of the optical system. Um, you could have electric fields that would shift river states out of the optical system. All these things are the things that, uh, that are taken into account with that particular uh, state. All right, so this is the punchline of what's happening is that um, when this fast transient actually, if you think about it, it's uh, a consequence of the fact that you change the EIT and it's easiest to understand if, the, uh, if you split the EIT piece enough that uh, you, have no, you have no transmission get absorption again on residence. In that case, what you've essentially done is turned off the river atom part of all this with some initial conditions on the D2 line. And so what's happening here in this fast transient is the um, the D2 line, or the sorry, so this is the yeah, D2 line, <laughs> um, 852 nanometers. That's coming back into equilibrium. And there's you know, there's other figures I'll show later, and you saw already. There's a little dip here. That's kind of evidence of like some copy oscillations as this um, as this uh, system comes into two level equilibrium, given whatever the initial conditions were imposed by that EIT system. What else happens after that? What's this from? This is actually, I think, um, simple to understand, but I like it because it's simple to understand. Um, all this bad stuff in the beam, right, it's drifting out. And so as, uh, as basically the atoms, say, for example, in a Rydberg state that's uncoupled, drift out of the laser beam, the interaction region, it's filled with more ground state atoms that can then now enter this two level system again. And so what happens is um, this is actually it's transit time broad. This is a transit time broadening effect as the kind of bad atoms, which only can be populated by the river state, actually are replenished with new ground state atoms from the background gas. Then everything is kind of in equilibrium again here. The absorption is equilibrium. And then when the EIT system turns back on, um, basically uh, what happens is that now the density is a little higher than it should be. And so you get some enhanced, depending on what the laser parameters, some enhanced collisional behavior here. And then it kind of comes back into equilibrium. Now, one of the things um, that's important to realize here is that we have to, you know, because we have to have the EIT on, so we are constantly kind of populating this dark state. There's some equilibrium number of Rydberg atoms that are going to be uh, in that dark state uh, because uh, you don't know when the pulse is really coming. So you have to kind of keep the whole system simmering until you, your pulse arrives. So between pulses, you're starting to populate that, that dark state. And that's why when you turn off everything, the ground state atoms kind of come back into the beams, and then uh, you know you have higher density of ground state atoms here. All right. Um, so here is uh, experimental data, and then here is uh, simulated data for different Robbie frequencies. And if you want to use this kind of fast transient for timing, um, you really want to be in the low, you know, you want to be in the weak probe regime where you where you have a lot of EIT so that when the system kind of gets um, uh, perturbed, um, it has to really come back uh, into the equilibrium in the first two states. And so um, you can kind of see here in the simulations, you get some more oscillations here um, uh, than you do in the experiment, but you can kind of see that there's a little bit of the same features in here. Um, the, Time response of the of the system kind of damps out the peaks in the, in the experiment. Um, we did 
for this part, change the laser beam size and looked at what happens when we do that. Um, and you get the behavior that you would expect if this was really what I said it was, which is the um, laser, are the atoms drifting in and out of the laser beams. Um, there's also some electric field effects from where you're positioned in the cell. This, this cell actually did have some electric fields in it, and that kind of perturbs um, this kind of recovery up here. Uh, and that's just because of the um, things that happen in the collisions and then the, the uh, start shifting of the atoms and atom principles. So um, I know I'm going to go through the whole um, slide here, but um, what matters in how the, the pulse recovers is really, um, you know, what the excited state is. That's mostly has to do with kind of what collisions can take place. I'll show an example of that later here. Um, you know, how many, you know, this, this actually really the ratio between like the detuning, the coupling laser power and uh, um, the probe laser power tells us how much uh, population is in that Rydberg state. You know, in ideal EIT, you'd have no population in the intermediate state, but you'd have some in the, uh, the upper state. And the, the ratio of all these kind of optical parameters tells you what that, what that is, you know, you have some control over. Um, and then also, um, we did observe um, some dependence uh, in the vapor cell, which is kind of shown here, which I can analyze to attribute to, to electric fields, which kind of points back to some of the things I was saying beginning is that it's very important to kind of try to get rid of those effects as much as possible because they do change um, your observations and they would vary from vapor cell to vapor cell. All right, so here are some measurements that really kind of, I think, demonstrate um, where, uh, you know, that the, that the collisions kind of do matter. Um, so if we're in kind of a, you know, a regime where we have very low um, Rydberg population, and we excite different states with different um, uh, coupled uh, transitions here, um, we get pulses that are basically identical. So all these kind of pulses really lie on top of each other because there's not much um, collisional stuff happening here. Um, there's a little bit, but it's almost almost the same for, for every pulse. And, these guys don't really matter that much because uh, most of what, um, most of where the um, bad stuff is coming from is when uh, the time, in the time between the pulses, when uh, we're just sitting there populating Rydberg uh, states and then they can collide and do other bad things. But um, uh, here in this case, we've increased the coupling uh, Robbie frequency, and we populated more of these Rydberg states. So there's a higher population here. And now you can see there's a difference here. So there's a more um, dramatic effect here because we uh, populated more of the bad state in the in between pulses. And then in the recovery here, we also see kind of a, you know enhanced collision rate on the uh, 55 D uh, five halves. Uh, states here. So why is that? So if you look at the pair potentials between the Rydberg states, you can really understand why this is happening. Um, so for 55 D5 halves, you have kind of attractive potentials here where you can actually lose population. Whereas in the 58 S1 half, that's mostly repulsive. So there's no coupling to this because these aren't really, there's no dipole coupling between these. It's direct. There's a kind of a, a strong crossing here but you know, the land has you know, probability of making that transition is not very high. And so um, this state is not collision free because of the stuff that's kind of happening up here, but it's uh, less susceptible to collisions than, than this is, less susceptible population of the dark state. So even in this kind of physics here, um, in the vapor cell, these Rydberg collisions are, um, you know, they can actually have an effect uh, that's observable and you have to take them into account. Um, and I guess this goes back to the one of the points I made at the very beginning is that the, the very resonance that we're using to get high sensitivity also gives us um, long range collisions. It's the same, it's the same uh, scaling really, it's the same, same kind of um, 
effect. It's the high transition dipole moments that um, that lead you to have these very long range collisions. And you can look here and see, you know, this is out at like four microns apart. And it's the same thing as you for dipole blockade. All right. So how do we best maximize or optimize the signal that we're receiving now that we know and understand the physics of the pulses that come in? So um, what we were uh, implementing is a match filter. And what's interesting about implementing a match filter on the system is that the match filter is tailored down to the physics of the incoming pulse as modified by the atomic response. And it's also uh, a filter that's directly hooked up to the antenna. So no amplifier, no other signal processing uh, before, um, before that uh, uh, filter is applied. So the match filter basically is a correlation uh, filter and it comes across the, the signal up here. And when the match filter basically matches the pulse in time, um, uh, we've essentially matched the Fourier spectrum of this to this and then when they overlap, you get the maximum energy in that filter, and then uh, you get a, a, a pulse that looks like this with a little point on it, which is what's used for timing and things like radio. So this can actually help the signal to noise quite a bit. Um, so here's a bunch of uh, pulses. Um, the kind of nice lines are, are highly average, but the um, but the single pulses here, the, the noisy ones are just, uh, as I said, single pulses. And this is the match filter uh, response from the single pulses. And you can kind of see what a dramatic increase in signal noise you get from this. Um, you know, and it's mostly because you know what this pulse is supposed to look like. So you're kind of looking for something that looks like uh, what your expectation is. So um, we're able to get quite good um, sensitivity with this actually with just uh, a matched filter attached to the sensor, um, you know, with something like 240 nanovolts per, uh, uh, you know, per centimeter per square root hertz without anything else, no auxiliary field or anything, still entirely dielectric sensor and signal processing. All right, so um, I have some time left, so I'll keep going, but um. Here is uh, the normalized match uh, filter um, peak height versus the kind of RF field that um, is applied. And what we're looking for here is like the, how the match filter responds to the different pulses because the pulses are sorry, under different conditions, the EIT widths are changed. And so there's two regimes, right? Where you would split the entire um, uh, EIT spectrum so that then you would have the maximum transition, which is uh, the maximum kind of absorption, I should say, um, which is reflected in this kind of flat signal here. Or um, you could have a, a broader DIT signal, you could artificially broader, broaden it by changing the, um, the laser rodney frequencies. And um, then you could actually kind of distinguish what the power and the pulse was over a broader range of, um, of field amplitudes. And so um, that's kind of this situation, the kind of situation here where we get a flat line where you can see the um, effect of these um, enhanced absorption features in this little bump here. Um, so here you split, 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 and then all of a sudden you start to, this is the kind of amplitude regime here. So that's kind of what that is there. Um, this is just kind of looking at signal noise as a function of the coupling laser power. So you can kind of change that uh, around and look for the optimum uh, kind of coupling uh, laser power. And you kind of see that, that um, you know, you should really be kind of in this weak probe regime where the, the coupling laser power is um, larger than the, um, or at least on this, I guess it's not quite the weak coupling um, regime, but it's close to the weak coupling regime. So what we found is that the signal to noise ratio is kind of optimum where the coupling laser power is a little bit larger than what the probe laser power is. So it's not quite technically um, the weak coupling regime. Um, 
uh, this is kind of just uh, looking at different pulse widths. Um, you know, looking at the signal to noise ratio, and you can get quite good signal to noise ratio for um, the longer pulse widths, but you can kind of see consistent with the um, response of the atoms that the um, signal to noise ratio goes down as the um, pulse width would decrease. Okay, so that means you lose signal to noise as the uh, pulses change and in, in, in uh, width. And as they get smaller, it's less. Um, you can also look at the timing precision here, um, which is also another kind of parameter that's important. So this is kind of looking at how well you can time the peak of that matched filter um, for different pulses. Um, and you can see that um, uh, for uh, basically for uh, small RF amplitudes or short um, pulses, you get less um, precision timing as you'd expect. That's just because of the signal to noise ratio. Um, but um, at larger fields, um, we're mostly limited by the FPGA that we used in the sampling rate across the pulse. So these are just distributions of um, pulses at different field amplitudes to show what the air and the tide is due to the noise. Um, okay, so that's all nice for signal processing. It's pretty simple. Um, it's advantageous because you're just hooking up this signal processing directly to the antenna, no other electronics or anything in between. But so, but the match filter technically assumes that it's a linear time invariant system. And that's not really uh, true of the system, but uh, in the regime kind of that I showed you, it, it's approximate to that. At very low, um, at very low um, RF fields, the pulse changes shape. It has these kind of little uh, things on here, and that's because um, that has to do with uh, um, you know kind of recovery from elect you know from electric field effects and these um, and collisions and things like that. Um, and then also um, the pulse repetition rate here. If it's too fast, then uh, the neighboring pulse in the response of the atom will start to perturb um, how the next pulse responds. So there's kind of a maximum repetition rate, um, you know, related to that pulse width that you can um, to do and not have the pulses kind of change each other. Um, and so, of course, we're, we try to work outside of that and figure out what the limits of that are. Um, this problem is not so much of a problem for the match filter because um, you could run, um, in fact, you could run that signal that you're acquiring through as many mass filters as you want, look at the signal. So one uh, approach to this might be to have a, uh, you know, a low power, lower power mass filter and a higher power mass filter, and then we'd kind of compare the two uh, and use the one that was most appropriate uh, in the experiment or in the, the device. All right. Um, so uh, this is actually kind of just a cute demo that we did to show that um, this would work for radar. So what we did is we, I'll show a little um, video here in a second, but um, we modeled uh, having our receiver placed at some position. And then, um, so we have a fancy signal generator where we can um, tell it that it's a really a, uh, basically an airplane with a rotating uh, antenna on it and it will kind of mimic uh, that situation. And so uh, these are the pulse trains um, from, from that situation here. I'll just show how it, uh, it worked here. If I can get to my slide. Let's see if I can 
What's not running naturally? What's a seed? All right, it's not going to work for me. Um, but maybe you forgot to be separate. Um, let me see. I was trying to do that in uh, the uh, <laughs> the slides that I'm sharing. It don't seem to be. Uh, Advancing the same. Oh, there we go. Okay. So, anyway, that's the signal that was kind of generated here, uh, moving at kind of a couple hundred meters per second and past. Uh, around half a kilometer away from this um, signal. This is really kind of a toy um, thing because uh, the sensitivity of, of just the, um, the receiver with this single vapor cell is really not um, competitive with any type of um, real, real receiver. It's not terrible, but it's not uh, by no means uh, great. But, but you have to note that it also doesn't have any sort of collector on it, like a dish, which most, um, most uh, radar receivers would have. But what's kind of interesting here is that you do detect the pulses um, uh, in this way, but you also can see here, um, and, this, and this was kind of purposely done, is that the signal um, was quite high when it passed right next to the receiver. And usually um, all these lobes would have this kind of um, uh, shape here. It's kind of like a maybe parabolic shape, um, you know, reflective of the lobes of the antenna. But here it's cut off, and that's because um, the signal was strong enough to split the uh, TP. So um, there was kind of a maximum uh, uh, amplitude that you could um, kind of sense at that uh, uh, there, which is kind of uh, interesting. All right. So that was kind of just a toy problem. Um, I guess I conclude here, and I, know, well, I guess I made it on time. Um, that, uh, uh, you know, I guess. Uh, what I told you about today was uh, how to overcome uh, Doppler shifts in the measurement so that we could actually get to a, a spectral, at least have an avenue to go forward to a spectral resolution that's on the um, spectral scale of the decay of the Rydberg atoms, which is kind of all you can do. So that's good. Um, and I also told you about um, maybe uh, thinking about an application of pulse detection and thinking in the context of the real technology where you have to think about how that particular technology responds. You know, if we had just said, um, well, uh, this is just like an antenna and that pulse is kind of approximately uh, the pulse we would get from uh, some RF signal, um, which most people have done, that's not really what's happening. The atomic response actually shapes the pulse. It makes this different than what you would get from an antenna. And you have to take that into account to kind of, um, you know, actually uh, optimize the system. You have to look and see how the atoms respond to our pulses, not how an antenna responds to our pulses. So with that, I guess I'll conclude and, and thanks. Um, it's software, so it's done all digitally in the FPGA. So the signal's fed directly into the FPGA. Done that. So you can actually change the filter on the fly too. Like we talked about. Thanks regarding the so basically, so you edit this per labor, but since you should be taking like an industrial application, but then you can then today you want to make contact, right? So are you at all like um, worried about worried about having like stability issues, especially since it's a few microscopes? Yeah, I, there's another piece that uh, I haven't talked about that um so for that system, right now it's a tabletop system as we optimize it. But um, we're also making uh, photonic integrated circuits for those lasers. 
uh, to make them more compact, be able to control the temperature and their drift and things like that. Um, also, there's a lot of stuff in that box that I showed you that we're trying to finish drive, but a lot of stuff in that box to control the frequency of uh, the lasers um, and stabilize them. And there's a whole part I didn't talk about about like the control programming, so that things like a little bit of a, a little robot that kind of follows the follows the environment conditions to adjust. So, so, so do you think that you, you can make it stable enough to actually in unstable environment? Um, you know, potentially, I think like our first goal is to put some of this stuff into, the, you know, at least like test and measurement labs and, and the such. Um, and we're trying to get it that stable, but I wouldn't say that it's that stable now. That's kind of the reason to maybe go towards photonic integrated circuit packages that make it more stable. But there is a hope to do that, but we're not. Uh, and I think it's possible. I think it's it's, it's work. You know, um, we were able to take this fairly complicated experiment and take it off the bench and put it in a box, and it is fairly robust. You know, it's it's enough that, like I said, I could drop the box. You know, this far, and it still all works. Um, you know, there is like a challenge when you tell engineers who are going to use this that there's three lasers in it. That, that might be the harder, you know, the harder. They only want to press a button. In. Yeah. Okay. You, you bring up much in this to this lecture, but I'm just wondering um, what kind of range of frequency can you set for the uh, side range? Yeah, so um, the kind of sweet spot for this is like um, maybe gigahertz, sub gigahertz. You know, that sub gigahertz maybe being a couple hundred megahertz up to 300 gigahertz. Um, you can can go higher to terahertz, but then you know at the higher end things start to get less continuous or less quasi-continuous. Um, and then um, some of the things like self-calibration and stuff like that, then you start to um, say it's a little, it's much harder because of the vapor cell effects. You know, those wavelengths start to get shorter, and then the technology of being able to make the vapor cells starts to be harder. Um, that doesn't mean you can't do just detection and imaging in those range because that might be um, interesting uh, uh, just because there aren't very many competitive room temperature detectors. There's some, but not, not that many. Most of them are still. Sure. 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 Transition to just go straight up is is not very good. You know, where it's like a UV transition. No, but that's not. That's just a technical thing. You know, yeah. Water, you know, but, yeah. You know, basically, there is there is no website or conference that's dealing with this, right? Yeah, but um, you know, I think that there's other effects like these collisions and things that don't allow you to kind of integrate for a long time. Like I think what you're talking about is to look at like Robby oscillations on the RF, right? Or yeah, and, and so there's a lot of there's a lot of phasing, and then there's and then collisions, and so you don't really have that many oscillations to uh, up there to actually make a decent measurement like you would in other systems. Now that being said, <laughs> we're involved with a project with Mike Ramallis where we're trying to do something like that and see see how bad it is. See, that should be a way. Usually, you know, I mean, like traditional are still quite small in the number, right? Um, yeah, they are, but you know, you also kind of have to measure 
good amount of oscillations. And so there's a lot of bad things that happen in the Rittenberg states. And that's kind of what the Rittenberg states so fragile. I mean, that's, a, that's a real problem. Do you have a technical question too? Oh, okay. So where do you see the applications? Um, so the, the ones that we're looking at now are test and measurement, because there's, I think I said this at the, the first kind of lecture, um, there's not really good ways to do measurements really even above 20 gigahertz, but certainly not above 40. And um, a lot of the, uh, RF technology is being pushed to higher frequencies because there's uh, there's a you know limited band limited bandwidth of RF and so um, most of the devices that people are building up there need to be certified and need to be tested against some standard and uh, conductive tests don't work very well they're very uh, bad and even if you could do conductive tests, some of these devices are so integrated and complex that uh, nobody's going to put taps on everything to test it, every device. And so you have to do over the air testing. And if you were to do over the air testing with a metal antenna, there's a lot of limitations there, not only with the antenna, but the testing. And this actually is electromagnetically transparent. You can do imaging, um, it's a single shot acquisition. And all kinds of um, things that are not possible. In, uh... One question. Is there something specifically technical that you can go by with the 2.2 microns, or is it just? It's just a laser volume mostly. Um, I think we have a way to do that, and we're working on it now. But but I but I guess I mentioned it because it's been such a frustration that. <laughs> I think you can all identify experimental frustrations. That's been one of them. <laughs> yeah, I think just that the anti reflection coatings and material are not as good or not as well developed as in other way, at least from the vendor that we have. Any other question? Um, there's nothing that's kind of quite like this that's self calibrated. So it would have to be um, when you say competing technologies, you kind of have to specify in one area. Um, but um, this, this technology where you can actually have self calibrated, you have that broad bandwidth, um, there's an, an, an electromagnetic transparency of the sensor. Those are the main features. Um, and so we've tailored, we've tried to tailor um, the paths we've taken to development to those features. No more questions, of course. Jim, you're out the rest of the week. Steph, take some Jacob's work also <laughs> if you want. Super interesting. Yeah. It's not really work either. It's just, uh, I think it's just some things you can, uh, uh, you know, it's questions that you can actually pick up and uh, think about. So maybe it makes you think about the lectures a little bit more deeply and ask yourself some questions about your own project. So. With that, join me. Thank you, Jim. Thank you.